Good morning and welcome to our weekly Bible prophecy update. On Sunday mornings we have two services, the first of which is the prophecy update, and then second service, which we'll talk about more in a moment, is our regular sermon, verse by verse teaching through the Bible. So I want to get right to it. I think you'll see why here in a moment, and talk with you about what's coming soon. But infinitely more importantly, who is coming soon? Spoiler alert, (laughs) Jesus is coming soon. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Actually, that's the purpose of these prophecy updates, by the way. It's to get Jesus to people, and people to Jesus, as many as we can, as fast as we can, while there's still time, because He is coming. Actually, it's by virtue of the fact that what's coming soon upon the whole world during the tribulation, that we're able to know, key word, Jesus is coming sooner in the rapture before the tribulation. Maybe just let me explain and expound on that. What we're seeing today, beginning to come to pass, with everything that's happening in the world, even now, will ultimately find its prophetic fulfillment in and during the seven year tribulation. But it's happening now. So this is what Jesus said about that. It's recorded in Luke 21, 28. When you see these things, keyword, begin to come to pass. Look up and lift up your head. Why? Because your redemption draws nigh. In other words, what we're seeing in the world today is exactly what we're told in the Bible will happen and be fulfilled during the last seven years of human history we know as the seven year tribulation. But it's already starting. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is the rapture, which has to happen before the seven year tribulation, must be sooner than what we see now coming soon, which will be in the seven year tribulation. Once again, as only the Lord can and seemingly has been for the last several weeks, today's verse by verse study titled, Keep On Keeping On, ties into today's prophecy update. And we'd encourage you to join with us. For those of you online, we will live stream this at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time. This is our second service where we're going through the Bible verse by verse. Last week we finished 2 Timothy, and today we're going to start in the book of Titus. We'll be looking at the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus, in which in just the first three verses, He answers this question of how and why he was able to endure unspeakable hardship up until the end. And so there is in that, I believe, an encouragement for us in these, the last days. So that's second service. If you'll just kindly (laughs) Allow me to, I want to, before we jump into this, take just a moment to update you on our jdfarag.org website. We again very much appreciate your patience with us, and more importantly, your prayers for us. Please, please continue praying for us. We have an amazing team that is doing their best, and we are very excited to announce that we're making progress. So, First, for the live stream on the site, pictured here is the home page where you'll see on the bottom left, you can select 
the Watch Live Bible Prophecy. For those of you that are on YouTube right now, uh, that's where you can go and it will take you to the live stream of this video. And actually we would encourage those of you that are either on YouTube or Facebook to go there from the start so it's uninterrupted and there you'll have the complete and uncensored update as the live stream here on social media is only the introduction. Second, I want to draw your attention to the on-demand videos of the updates, which will be uploaded as soon as possible once the live stream ends. Again, we very much appreciate your patience with us, but when this live stream ends, we will then upload the full video of today's update. It might take a little bit of time. We again very much appreciate your patience. Give us at least an hour or so, <laughs> heavy on the or so. Um, and then when it's there, simply select prophecy vids as pictured here on the top of the home page. It will then take you to the Bible Prophecy Updates page where you can select the update. Now pictured here, we've selected last week's update on February 14th titled Divide and Conquer. So when you select that, it will take you to that update, that video. And there you will find the share and download features closed caption video. Now on the closed caption video, again, we appreciate your patience. It's going to take a few days because we have to burn the closed captioning into a completely separate video for the hearing impaired. Uh, it is up now for last week's update, but again, give us a few days. But that option is now available the transcript of that update. We have an amazing team that <laughs> these people have treasures in heaven. Word for word, <laughs> uh, transcribe the update, and it's in a PDF file format. And you can click on that, and you can actually download the transcript of that update. Again, give us a little bit of time to get that uh, in place. The links that will be referenced in the update are there. You just have to click on it. And so too is the uh, description as well. We're working very hard uh, on this. And again, very much appreciate your patience with us on this. Uh, one last thing, if you don't mind. I'm already saying one last thing. We haven't even started. But uh, this is very important. Actually, uh, I need to bring your attention that we continue to have scammers on social media. It's getting worse. <laughs> uh, this uh, most recent one pictured here is a fake Facebook account that uses our photos and info. And they're trying to scam our Facebook followers. This is on YouTube on a, on a weekly basis. We get fake YouTube channels that use the photos and my name and they try to scam people uh, to give them money for an orf orphanage, of course. Uh, and so here's how you'll know <laughs> that it's fake. We will never message anyone asking them, as this account did, to, quote, kindly inbox me. We don't do that. Nor will we ever ask for money, ever. In fact, here, for the benefit of those of you online, we don't even receive an offering here, okay? And we actually just have boxes on the back walls for tithes and offerings. So please know that these are scams. And <laughs> okay, here's another one last thing. We haven't even started the update. One last thing. Pray for these people. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. Pray for their salvation. All right. Let's get started. We're going to begin, as we always do, with the Word of God. And we do this in order to establish a firm foundation as the basis 
And as always, I would encourage you to search and examine the Scriptures for yourself and see if what I'm saying is true or not. This is Acts 17.11, where we're told about the Berean Jews being more noble, of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. And we're told why. It's because they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Thankfully, we have many Bereans, both here locally in the church and online as well, who did this very thing and corrected me on last week's teaching in Second Timothy. I bet you want to know what it is. I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to join a second service. I'll tell you all about it. Very ironic, actually. So I uh, was corrected by the Bereans, for which I am very thankful. Okay, I want to preface the Scriptures that we're going to be looking at today by first apprising you of a concern. I just would ask that you uh, hear my heart on this and hear me out on this. It's concerning that of the profound weightiness and seriousness of what's happening in the world as to what's coming soon upon the world. And it's for this reason that it's incumbent upon me to boldly and fearlessly, yet lovingly, speak the truth in love, and sound the alarm, despite one's response or reaction to the message. The Lord, as of late, has been ministering to me out of Jeremiah. And in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we have the account of when God called Jeremiah. And He says to him, verse 8, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and will deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out His hand, and touched my mouth, and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. Now why do I share that? Because I have to confess, I would be disingenuous at best and dishonest at worst if I didn't. But I have to confess that there have been many times, over the past year in particular, when I have struggled with this very intensely, actually. And by that I mean boldly, yet lovingly preaching and teaching the unpopular prophetic Word of God, knowing that most don't want to hear it under the banner of being doom and gloom. My struggle is this. It's that I know that if I shrink back, not wanting the pushback, and I don't want the pushback, so you know, I don't particularly enjoy it. The pushback always ensues. But if I shrink back, I know that I will stand before God with blood on my hands. Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 7 through 9. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth, and warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die. 
And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. <laughs> so I suppose in all fairness you could say that there's a selfish motivation here. <laughs> uh, I don't want anybody's blood on my hands. And I want my own soul to be delivered. I don't want to stand before God and give an account. And one of the things that I fear the most is that there would be anyone on that day who would say, why didn't you say something to me? Why didn't you tell me? Did you not love me enough? Care enough about me to warn me? This is why I have to sound the trumpet of warning and warn you about what's coming soon. Here's the thing. I would rather sound the trumpet of warning and have it not come as soon as we thought, than not warn you only to have it come sooner than we thought. I truly believe with all my heart, more so than at any other time in my life, that everything happening in the world today is pointing to the soon return of the Lord in the rapture of the church, because we already see the things that will be fulfilled in and during the seven year tribulation. It's with this preface that I would like for us to go through these passages of Scripture, which will be germane to our understanding of just how close we really are. Let's start with the first chapter, beginning in the first verse of the book of Revelation. I want to read verses 1 through 3. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him, speaking of John, to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then verse 3, very interesting. Verse 3 tells us that of all of the books in all of the Bible, only the book of Revelation promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. And sadly, it is one of the most unread books in all of the Bible by Christians. Verse 3, blessed is the one, listen to this, who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Why? Oh, so glad you asked. Because the time is near. Let's go to the last book of the last, I mean the last chapter of the last book in the Bible, Revelation 22. I want to, oh, I love to hear the turning of those Bible pages. <laughs> Blesses a pastor's heart. I can hear you online too. Keep turning them. <laughs> Verse 6, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, look, 
I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Revelation chapter 3. We refer to this passage often. It's the letter to the church in Philadelphia, one of seven churches. John is told to write, verse 10, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial or tribulation, same word in the original, that is going to come on the whole world. That's a seven-year tribulation. To test the inhabitants of the earth. And then he says this, verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed, so as to not go naked and be shamefully exposed. The Apostle Paul echoes this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. And he says, now brothers and sisters about times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come, and here it is, like a thief in the night. Here's a thought. Think, think about this with me. How does a thief in the night come? Unexpectedly, right? I mean, you're never going to have a thief text you or email or call and say, hey, um, is 2 o'clock a.m. a good time for me to come and break in? And no, I know that's a silly way to illustrate this, but that's the best I got. So that's what you're going to get. If you got something better, let me know, please. But that's what the Lord's saying. That's what Paul is echoing here. That's how the, the Lord's going to come. It's going to be unexpected. At an hour, you think not. Because if, if you were expecting it, and the Thessalonian Christians were, and Paul even says, it, I, I, don't even, I don't even need to expound on this. I don't even need to write to you about this, because you already know this. Know what? That the Lord's going to come like a thief in the night. In other words, He's going to come at an hour that people expect Him not. And they're going to be caught off guard. But not you, <laughs> because you know and you expect Him to come. And that's why you're ready. That's why you're awake. That's why your eyes are open. That's why you're watching. And I'll even take it a step further, referring to 2 Timothy, where Paul, knowing his days are numbered at the end of his life, says, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. <laughs> and now there awaits me a crown of righteousness, but not just me. All of those too who long, dare I say, ache, yearn, await for His return. I would venture to say that there are many here today, many watching online as well. And for you, especially now with what's happening, <laughs> the Lord cannot come soon enough. Lord, come quickly. Romans 13 verse 11, the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit writing to the church in Rome says, do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Here's why. Because 
our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This is well nigh 2,000 years ago, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, penned these words to the Roman Church. Our salvation is so near, so much so it is nearer than I believe any of us, myself included, can possibly even begin to imagine. Here's the bottom line with these scriptures and really the many like them. They all speak to just how quickly and unexpectedly it's all going to happen. I want to pose this question and I want us to answer this question. I want you to think this through with me as I pose it. Think about what's happened in just the last year. So here we are towards the end of February 2021. Let's rewind to February of 2020. <laughs> are you there yet? We'll wait. Let me know when you're there. <laughs> now think about this. How much has happened since this time last year? How fast has everything happened since this time last year? One, one more part to that. How much has everything changed? since this time last year. We're talking about a span of 12 months. Now here's the question I want to pose. If that's how fast everything happened, if that's how much everything changed since last year at this time, what's coming? And how fast is it coming? in the months, even weeks, that lie ahead? Well, we're going to answer that question today. And at this time we're going to end the live stream here and redirect those who aren't there yet to jdfarag.org for the uncensored remainder. What if I told you that the answer to the aforementioned question of what's coming is not only coming soon, but already here. What's already here? Well, again, what's already here is exactly what we're told will be here in the seven year tribulation. Namely, the technology for global tracking, restricting, and controlling of the world's population. Even more specifically, tracking, controlling, and restricting those who do not have a mark or a pass, if you prefer, from buying basic necessities, opening up their businesses, keeping their jobs, and traveling, etc., etc., etc. I'll start with a local news article my wife sent me from KITV here in Hawaii. The reason my wife sent it to me is because I don't watch the local news anymore here in Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, no disrespect. I just can't. It's a, it's a blood pressure thing, but anyway. <laughs> I actually don't even watch national news anymore. <laughs> it's all programming. And by the way, if you doubt what I just said, just think about how angry you get when you watch TV. I'm going to take it a step further. Why not? At this point, <laughs> my wife says to me one day, she goes, you know why the Amish 
don't have COVID? Because they don't have TVs. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one right there. Enough said, as we say. One more, one more. why not? <laughs> she was um, sharing with me a portion of a podcast she was listening to, and this is what they said. They said, if they reported on a daily basis the number of deaths due to automobile accidents, we would never get in a car. Think about that. Okay. Well, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So back to our local news article here. I want to quote this article. The state is setting up a health pass system that uses technology to verify your negative COVID-19 test results and vaccination doses. So you can travel and keep your information private. Yeah, right. <laughs> Hawaii is doing a pilot program with a company called Clear and is in talks with the nonprofit, the Commons Project Foundation, whose CEO, KITV, interview. Quoting the CEO, Paul Meyer, the airlines have the obligation to inspect those certificates. Well, what does that mean? It means that everyone has to go to the ticket counter, which takes a long time and is sort of terrible from a social distancing perspective, because you're basically, in order to reduce risk, you're telling people to show up at the airport and get in a long line and hand pieces of paper to the checking agent to inspect. Oh, interesting. Huh. So, still quoting, Part of the reason that the airlines are very keen on this model is they want to be able to let people do online check-in, where you can actually upload a digital copy of your test result or, listen, eventually vaccination record. Have it digitally read and be able to authorize you to check in online, which again means you don't have to queue up at the airport. We feel like we can safely reopen if people have been tested or, here it is again, eventually have been vaccinated. But if you don't know, you can trust that test result or vaccination, it becomes harder to put those kinds of policies in place to be able to appropriately allow travel to resume, but still protect the population's health, Meyer said. The article goes on to quote Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, who said, quote, he wants to apply the technology beyond travel to allow large gatherings. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> like concerts, sporting events, weddings, and graduations. This is the way to open up events and our state. And if we do it in a smart way, we will restore the economy that we crashed and collapsed intentionally in the first place. Sorry, that's not in the article. <laughs> we will restore the economy without any bumps in the road, and we'll actually get back to normal way faster, Lieutenant Governor Green said, close quote. In preparing for a prior update last year, I did some research on Common Pass and learned that it comes from none other than the World Economic Forum. 
no surprise. <laughs> At the time, I discerned that this was coming soon as a pass for those with a negative test under the guise of what would quickly transition from a test to a vaccination. Pictured here is a screenshot of a video on the World Economic Forum's website of Paul Meyer, the Commons Project Foundation CEO that KITV interviewed. In this video posted on August 24th, he states, and I quote, Common Pass is a platform that lets people safely and securely collect their health information, whether it is a negative COVID test result or, here it is again, eventually, soon, can I say soon, a COVID vaccination. And then manage that information, control it themselves, and then be able to let that information be used to demonstrate that they have had a negative test or they have been vaccinated so they can get on an airplane or travel to another country. This comports with an Arut Sheva article published on November 26th with a very interesting heading reading, We Won't Force Vaccine, but here's what we will do. Here's the quote. Health Ministry Director Hezi Levy insisted to reporters that, quote, we won't force people to take a vaccine. Israeli law doesn't allow for it. Oh, whew. not so fast. Speaking before the Special Knesset Coronavirus Committee, Medical Center Chief Medical Officer and Chief Innovation Officer Dr. Eyal Zimlechman listed measures that are being planned to, listen to this, maneuver the population into vaccination as a way of regaining freedom of movement, the freedom that we took away from them to begin with as part of the plan. The issue, still quoting, of how to motivate vaccine compliance has generated increasing interest with commentators such as Mike Cernovich writing, and I'm still quoting, government won't force you to take a vaccine. Amazon will. Airlines will. Banks will you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade without the vaccine. I, that's a quote, and the link is below. I wonder, do these people read Revelation 13 go, oh, we need to make sure that they know that without this they can't buy, sell, or trade. You know, nah, I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> you're going, no, do it. <laughs> well, okay, I will. <laughs> Back in March of last year, since we're rewinding the clock <laughs> to last year, I was called every name of the book plus new ones that were invented for talking like this, saying, this, this is it? Oh, man, Pastor, you're, you're off the rails. You've, you've lost your marbles. I, that presupposes I had marbles to lose from the beginning. You're, you're completely given over to conspiracies. Okay. Okay. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> I don't mean to be mean. <laughs> Can I just say it? Told you so. 
a year ago. That's where this was heading. And now it's here. It's not that I need to be right or vindicated. The Lord knows my heart. I take no delight in this. Oh, believe you me. I would love to stand behind this pulpit, as is my privilege to every week, and just, God bless you. God loves you. Let's just all have a big group hug. I can't. I can't. Everything's going to be okay. I think about when the prophets would say, peace, peace, nothing to see here. Stay calm, carry on, go back home, eat, drink, be merry, when there's no peace. So Israel apparently has had this plan in place to motivate, incentivize, and get people to get vaccinated. You might be surprised to know that they've been met with a large measure of success. Pictured here is a graph from Our World in Data on January 18th, published by the BBC, showing the reported vaccine doses administered per 100 people in the 10 countries with the most vaccinations. And not only is Israel leading the world, they're doing so at a significantly higher rate than the U.S., which is fourth on the list. Now, why do I point this out? Because Israel has enforced strict lockdowns repeatedly. And they've done so, so as to maneuver and motivate the population towards vaccine compliance in order to regain their freedom of movement. And it worked. It worked. Last Tuesday, Times of Israel published a very telling article titled, How Israel Plans to Operate a COVID Green Pass and Prevent Forgeries. While I-24 News reported just this morning that this is being implemented only in certain instances, the intent is to make many activities available only to those vaccinated and that can prove it with said green pass. Let me quote the article. Street front shops, malls, markets, museums, and libraries will be open to all Israelis, but only those who have been vaccinated or have recovered from COVID-19 will be able to use gyms and enter sporting and culture events, hotels, and swimming pools showing green pass proof to gain access. The coronavirus czar Nahman Ash said Monday, that Israelis will have to use an app as proof or print out barcoded certificates to prove their status. On Thursday, the New York Times of all publications <laughs> published this very interesting article bearing the title, As Israel Reopens Whoever does not get vaccinated will be left behind. Interesting choice of words. <laughs> Quoting, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet voted this week to open shopping malls and museums to the public, subject to social distancing rules and mandatory masking. For the first time in many months, gyms, cultural and sports events, hotels and swimming pools will also reopen, but 
only for some. Under a new green badge system that functions as both a carrot and a stick, another interesting choice of words, carrot and a stick to bait you, to coerce you, to motivate you, to incentivize you, to maneuver you, dangle the carrot. The government is making leisure activities accessible only to people who are fully vaccinated or recovering starting Sunday. That's today. Two weeks later, restaurants, event halls, and conferences will be allowed to operate under those rules. Customers and attendees will have to carry a certificate of vaccination with a QR code. So no longer is it, where are your papers? Sorry about that. Not really. It's where is your QR code? <laughs> I'll do that in Arabic if you want, but that might be disturbing, so I won't. I have to add the levity, okay? If I don't laugh, I'll cry. Seriously, by the way. Getting vaccinated is a moral duty. It is part of our mutual responsibility, said the health minister, Yuli Edelstein. He also has a new mantra. Whoever does not get vaccinated will be left behind. The debate swirling within Israel is percolating across other parts of the world as well, with plans to reserve international travel for vaccinated green passport holders. Israel's central government, eager to bring the country out of its third national lockdown without setting off a new wave of infections, was spurred into action by local initiatives chafing under the country's lockdown regulations, an indoor shopping mall in the working class Tel Aviv suburb of Bat Yam threw its doors open last week for customers who could prove that they had been vaccinated or had recovered from COVID-19. In Carmiel, the mayor made a similar decision to open his city in the northern Galilee region for business. His office began processing requests from employers who could verify that all of their employees had received the requisite two vaccine doses or had recovered from the virus. And in other cities, mayors wanted to bar unvaccinated teachers from classrooms while some hoteliers threatened unvaccinated employees with dismissal. It's not coming, it's already here. Still quoting, Dr. Pellet Raz said, the temporary emergency law governing Israel's response to the virus would be easier to amend with regard to health workers than to others because of the potential harm to themselves and patients, adding that would be justified. And then he says this quote, you want to be a nurse and you won't get vaccinated? either get vaccinated or choose another profession. I want to quote this Israel Hayom article from December 25th, in which they ask the question of, where will Israel's green passport proof of COVID vaccination take you? The subheading reads, vaccinated Israelis will be able to travel to the Dead Sea, Elat, skip mandatory quarantine if they return from abroad or come in contact with a coronavirus patient and visit cultural venues and attend sporting events. Only if you're vaccinated. At the end of the article, they quote intelligence minister Eli Cohen as saying, 
This is great news for businesses and a significant catalyst for a return to normal life. The launch of the Green Passport Program is a vital step toward opening businesses and reviving the economy. It will be a major, I want you to listen to this word, incentive for people to get vaccinated. So Thursday morning, I'm sitting in my office, I got my uh, screens with the channels all on mute. In fact, they're stuck on mute. If I tried to unmute them, I don't think they would unmute because I just can't listen to it anymore. But I just caught this one screenshot on I-24, which is a news broadcast out of Israel. And they have this segment. Oh, good. You would. Wait till I get there before you start. <laughs> you see the Tel Aviv bars offering free beer with vaccine shot. Incentive. You want a beer? <laughs> you have to be vaccinated. So this was Thursday morning. A couple hours later, I saw a subsequent broadcast on the same story. I'll let you read. Go ahead and read the thing, because you're already there. Tel Aviv bar entices residents to vaccinate with free booze. Yeah, there's some incentive for you. You know what the reporter said? I, I was astounded. She said, bars are offering free shots for shots. <laughs> Let that sink in. You have to get the shot to get a shot. How about that? You'll forgive me for saying this again. But it is inexplicable to me that people buy the lie that this vaccine is so safe and effective that you have to be coerced and even forced to take it. For a virus, we're told, is so deadly that you have to be tested to know if you even have it. Last week, an online member sent me a video of Catherine Austin Fitz and Dolores Cahill, both of which I've quoted in previous updates. This video was in December, and it was an interview by Monica Helleberg, the chairman of the World Freedom Alliance. What follows, and we have the, the links. Oh, by the way, this is probably as good of a time as any to say, if you go to a link that we provide and that's not there anymore, that's because they took it down. So we're, we'll do our best to <laughs> provide these links, but there's no guarantees. They're scrubbing everything from the internet. So here are several quotes from this interview, starting with Dolores Cahill. People are being coerced. They are being told they can't leave their homes or that they can only get employment or travel if they take vaccines. I've spent 20 years working in immunology. I would not take them. I wouldn't recommend them for any of my family. And I more or less put my career on the line to try and get the information out that in the last 40 years, zero RNA vaccines have been licensed to be on the vaccine schedule. Zero. I've said, if you paid me $10 million, I wouldn't take it. I would go to prison first. And if someone vaccinated me, I would charge them with attempted murder. Catherine Austin Fitz. 
This is all part of a transition. And what the central bankers are doing is engineering central control and using the financial system to engineer financial control. Many of the health restrictions are all about engineering that central control. So this is a huge concentration of power and wealth. The critical issues before us are, are we going to be a human society or an inhuman society? Are we going to concede to them? So this is a big, very tricky transition year for the central bankers. It goes down to each individual choice and everyone making their own choices. You see so many people say, well, if I want to not lose my job, I have to comply. If I should not be seen as a conspiracy theorist, I have to agree to this craziness. But I believe that people know something's wrong. People know what's going on. But we need, like you say, to inspire and get the courage. This is madness, you know to wear masks, to inject an unsafe vaccine, to completely devastate the whole planet's economy. This is political bushwhacking. Okay, you're looking at me with that look. I didn't know what bushwhacking meant either. So I looked it up. You know what bushwhacking means? Attacking, ambushing. This sort of brings us full circle to the beginning and the matter of what's coming soon that's already here, and because of it, who is coming soon and very soon. I am personally of the belief that it is only a matter of time before the vaccine becomes mandatory for everyone and not just frontline workers who are being required now. Just yesterday I received an email from an online member who works in the medical field that sent me a screenshot, a picture of this notification. It says, and I quote, we are taking all necessary precautions as we look forward to getting back to normal. All employees will be mandated to offer proof of receipt of an FDA approved vaccination within 45 days. Employees who do not fulfill this requirement will be placed on unpaid leave of absence and their status will be evaluated by human resources to determine if their employment will be continued. Translated, you don't get the vaccine, you can't buy food, you can't work, you can't earn a living. Your employment, (laughs) terminated, terminated. All right. I'm going to say this this way, and once again, I hope you don't tire of me saying this. If you do tire of me saying this, then you're going to be really tired, because I'm going to keep saying this. But I truly believe that the rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ is at the door. And and I'm not just saying that, I'm, I'm saying it with forensic evidence. And that forensic evidence is the scriptural and biblical support concerning the prophecies in the seven year tribulation and the sound doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. 
And if everything that we're seeing in the world now is already taking shape for the seven-year tribulation, and the rapture has to happen before the seven-year tribulation, then I ask you, how close are we? We will not be here for this. That's not to say that things won't get infinitely worse before the rapture. They certainly will, and many will be faced with this decision, which by the way, we've talked about in depth at length in previous updates by that title, by the way, Decision Time. <sighs> Been doing these weekly prophecy updates for going on now uh, 15 years. And I have to say, I, I don't know what to say except it's happening. And this is it. And this is why we do these updates. And I'm going to make no assumptions. You might be here sitting in this church. We're glad that you are. You might be watching online. We're glad that you are. But if Jesus were to come, you would be left behind. And not because of the vaccination, as we just read. <laughs> it's because you weren't ready. You weren't ready for Jesus, because you weren't right with Jesus. And that's why we do what we do every week, and share the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. Your debt has been paid. The penalty has been paid in full. You're free to go. Good news. What debt? What penalty? Oh, the death penalty. It's been paid for you instead of you, because Jesus came. He was crucified. He died for you. He was buried. And on the third day He rose again. And He's coming back again one day soon and very soon. That's the good news. That's the gospel going on about three years now, I think it is actually. We've been doing the ABCs of salvation. It is a childlike explanation of salvation. And it was about three years ago that the Lord really impressed upon my heart to start doing this. And boy, am I so glad that we did. It's a very simple way to explain salvation. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you've sinned, that you need the Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. And Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again, Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 is interesting because it sort of packages the bad news first with the good news. What's the bad news? Oh, it's really bad. <laughs> it's the death penalty. We've all been sentenced to death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. What's the good news? Ah. Oh, the good news is, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Think about a gift. If you pay for it, it's not a gift, it's a purchase. But a gift is something that someone had to purchase to give you as a gift, right? He purchased it. He purchased it. And He paid for it in full. And it cost Him everything. It cost Him His life. And He paid for it. And He offers this gift of eternal life. 
Here's the B. The B very simply is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised Him from the dead. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will, will be saved. We're going to talk about this more second service in our study in Titus, the assurance of knowing, as the Apostle John says, that you can know that you have eternal life. It's a done deal. The jury is no longer out. The verdict is in. You will be saved. And the C lastly is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, Romans 10, 13, this seals the deal. It says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, I implore you, and I know we talk a lot about how close we are to the rapture, but what if your untimely death precedes the rapture? You'll forgive me if that sounds morbid, but again, it's the truth. It's the truth. I want to share with you, actually this happened at uh, Jan Markell's conference a couple of years ago. And then I want to share with you a very moving testimony from an online member, if you'll just give me a couple more minutes. It was right before it was uh, my turn to speak. And there's this precious sister in Christ that was standing in line and um, introduced herself to me and with tears streaming down her face was thanking me specifically for the ABCs of salvation. And she proceeded to tell me a story that <sighs> she said that she used the ABCs of salvation to share the gospel with a dear friend of hers who was really going through a difficult time and having serious marriage problems. And it was just really bad. So she shared the ABCs of salvation and her friend came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. She led her to the Lord, and she got saved. That following Sunday, she went to church with her. And again, with tears streaming down her face, she shares about how her new, <laughs> newly saved friend is just praising the Lord, and just born again, and saved, and in Christ. And a new creation. It was shortly after that, that her husband murdered her, and then killed himself. Days before she had given her life to Christ. I'll close with a very moving testimony that comes from an online member, Judith Reagan, who writes, Blessings to you, Pastor J.D. I am writing you because I lost the love of my life on February 6, 2021, a couple weeks ago. Sean has been watching, listening to your prophecy updates and Bible studies for a few years now. We were both waiting for the Lord Jesus to take us and meet us in the air. But Sean went there first. I was not expecting him to pass away, but he has been in and out of the hospital and in constant pain for reasons that had no real diagnosis. I tell you this because Sean passed away in a very special way. He came home from the hospital the very evening that he passed. He was supposed, it was supposed that he was all better. He started feeling a little dizzy, and I got up and walked him to his side of the bed. I then went to my side of the bed and sat down. Then just a moment later, 
Sean laid down in the bed, rested his head on the pillow and said, I feel better now. I said, that's good, sweetie, and glanced over at him, and his tongue was blue. I tried to wake him, but was unable. I ran to his side of the bed, flipped him over and felt for a heartbeat. There was none. I frantically tried to get the phone on, all the while delivering CPR to my love, but he was gone. Jesus took him. Sean spent at least the last three years learning about Jesus through pastors like you. He enjoyed you and would watch without me, but was happy to watch and listen to your teachings over and over again. But what a gift it was that Jesus gave me on that horrifying day. He let me hear my husband say, I feel better now, with his very last breath. I visualize him seeing Jesus at that very moment. God is good all the time. Sean loved the ABCs of salvation and loved hearing the stories of people spreading the gospel and your Bible teachings. Because of that, I placed the ABCs of salvation on his obituary. He has many family members who do not know Jesus or refuse to accept Jesus. God bless you and keep you and yours. Love in Christ Jesus, Judith Reagan. Once you all stand, appreciate your patience. We'll have the worship team come up and I'd like to close in prayer. You know, I keep wondering, (laughs) which prophecy update is going to be the last? That's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. I really do. Because I truly believe we're that close. And I implore you, as a watchman on the wall, sounding the alarm. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, believing in your heart, trusting in Him for the forgiveness of sin. I mean, I guess in some ways I'm begging you. There's no more time. Do not put it off. This is the most important decision of your life for eternal life. And lastly, for those of us who (laughs) do know the Lord, love the Lord, walk with the Lord, just want to encourage you, not much longer. Just hold on. I know it's getting bad. It's getting scary. But he's coming. He's coming. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Lord, thank you for Bible prophecy, for telling us in your word what's going to happen before it happens. So when it begins to happen, we can know just how close we really are. And for those who do not know you, I pray, Lord, as they see what's happening, and know that in your word you said this was going to happen before it happened, that they will believe. They will believe and come to you and surrender to you and call upon you and be saved today, today. In Jesus' name, amen.